personal views and opinions expressed by our podcast guests are their own and are not legal advice or official statements by their organizations. Hello, uh, my name is Debbie Reynolds. This is the Data Diva Talks Privacy Podcast, where we discuss uh, privacy topics with industry leaders around the world with uh, business information that businesses need to know right now. So today I have a very special guest on the show uh, is Sana Toro Pinen, correct? I'm yeah, that's do it right. right. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. Uh, from Brussels, Belgium, she is the co-founder of Muna I O. She is a privacy data protection um, expert, and uh, Tor- Sana and I had the pleasure of meeting on LinkedIn, where she reached out to me, and um, uh, it was really cool because you wanted—I don't know what I had done or something—and um, you had co- contacted me about doing an article about yeah. uh, data monetization. Yeah. Uh, and so we've done a couple of other things since then. So I think you've quoted me in a couple of things. And I really love the article that you wrote because um, uh, the article, it, it almost starts out like a book or something. Because you're saying, <laughs> oh, you know, it's a great day in Belgium or whatever. Or, so it was really <laughs> cool to see to see the way that you had written that uh, that that article, but um, I would love for you to like introduce your company and the, some of the things that you work on so that the audience can get a more fulsome picture of you and the things that you do. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, sure. Well, first of all, I have to say, I'm, I'm very excited to talk to you again. And thanks so much for having me in this podcast. I was very excited when you reached out to me and asked if I would be uh, available uh, for this podcast because uh, since I reached out to you, I've really enjoyed our uh, conversations every time we get together and, and you're kind of like my first LinkedIn friend and uh, in, a, in a sort of professional way. I've been so excited to follow everything you do. You uh, always are uh, putting forth very in, uh, interesting and very timely topics uh, when it comes to privacy. Uh, so it's very, very exciting. And uh, I was just actually listening to your podcast with Olga Gislinska. Um, it was so well, she was talking about this um, consent and when it comes to like finding the middle ground between the company and the consumer. So I think what we're gonna talk today is gonna be a good continuance for that. Um, so now about myself. So I'm actually originally from Finland, but I've been here in Belgium for about five years, I originally, I went to, or at first I went to the Netherlands and I studied my legal degree there. So I studied comparative law and EU law. And while I was uh, studying, I also worked with a property law professor who was very, very into the question of can data be an object of a property law? Can you own data? And it was really through the work with him that I got so involved in the question of data ownership and then subsequently the question of data monetization. So after I finished my studies, I started to work on my own startup called Muna.io. And what we do is really enabling individuals to exchange exchange their data with companies in exchange for cash or discounts. So we are creating an application that has like a Tinder kind of like interface where you swipe through offers and that offer comes from the company. And what it says is what kind of data the, the company wants. You know, it can be just as simple as name, email, uh, and a postal code and what you get in exchange. So for example, a 10% discount to the product the company is selling. So what we want to, to give to consumers is this transparency and value exchange. So transparency, what data company gets from you and what purpose the company uses that data and that you get something in return, whether that's discounts or cash, like said. 
So we've been working on this. We started last year really full time, but obviously we did a lot of background work before that. And we wanted to have our pilot. So last year was meant to be a really big year for us having a, a pilot with uh, companies like airlines and hotels and uh, consumer good companies. But like for most of us, 2020 was a, a challenge. Mm -hmm. And we had to postpone the pilot because a lot of the companies uh, couldn't run their business anymore, like travel companies and, and, and so forth. So now 2021, we are hoping to, to do the pilot where we can work with companies that are putting offers on our application and then get to have uh, consumers uh, exchanging uh, their data. So that's uh, what the companies are doing at the moment. And uh, yeah, maybe a few other things about my background. Mm -hmm. So I said, yeah, I've been really focusing on privacy and uh, data protection questions. I also worked with uh, um, Belgium uh, telecommunication operator uh, with their cybersecurity governance. And uh, before my legal studies, I also worked with HR. Um, and because uh, my actually my first studies was social services and uh, somehow from social services and social work, I got into HR and from HR into law and data protection. Mm -hmm. So I, I do sort of come with this very social view and helping individuals. Uh, uh, so yeah, I think that's <laughs> maybe quite, quite interesting. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, data monetization or people, data ownership is such a hot issue um, yeah. because people, just like you're saying from the social perspective, people have, are, have very deep feelings, you know, one way or another regarding kind of data ownership and data protection. Uh, I think one thing I would love to talk to you about or get your opinion about is sort of the opinion or the, the feeling in Europe about data maybe being so different from the way that we feel about data in uh, the US. You know, part of that is the privacy being a fundamental human right in Europe where it's really not that way in the US. So uh, give me your thoughts about kind of those differences. Yeah, well, it's definitely a topic that raises a lot of opinions, but I think that there's also a lot of misconceptions when it comes to it. And that's um, like one of the, the misconceptions is that when you sell your data, you lose your right to data protection. And this is something that if you talk with, if you talk here in Europe to a, uh, an expert and they are of this opinion, then obviously they'll be saying like, no, like data should, like you should never sell your personal data because, uh, it, because it's a human right, privacy is a human right and you can never give away your human right. Now, the, this is um, what's problem. The problem in this argument is that it is actually not true because when you exchange your data, you are not actually selling your human right. Now, the, the, the problem here is that, or why people get confused is because when you sell something, you sell, you, you sell something you usually own, like you own a car, so you sell your car. Now, right to, to property is a transferable right. And once you transfer it, you no longer have the right to it. Human rights are not transferable, so you can never transfer away your right. And if you try to apply these two concepts to data, you get this idea that, okay, now I'm giving away my right to, to privacy. Mm -hmm. However, data is not an object of property law. There is no, legally, there's no such thing, thing yet as data ownership. So when you sell your data, you don't do it as if you would sell your car because you cannot, uh, you don't have a property right to data. But when you make a contract with a company that you can process my data with my consent, you are within the realm of the GDPR. And if you're in the realm of GDPR and you give consent to a company to process your data, you 
are you have you have a contract with them and the company respects your right then you still have the right to revoke your consent you have the right to to ask for a deletion so nothing happened to your right to privacy and this is one of the the core issues why in europe um, when we talk about data monetization from the personal point of view there's a lot of uh, emotions in, involved right yeah because i know a lot of my european friends uh, because we talk a lot and they're very passionate yeah. about privacy being a fundamental human yeah. right and being something that can't be sold which is true it's not like a property right where you transfer it um i don't know i think almost like there's a uh uh, Simpsons episode many years ago about Bart Simpson selling his soul to someone. <laughs> uh, so that's, to me, I sort of think of it that way. Like you really yeah. can't sell your soul really. So you yeah. really can't sell your, uh, your right to privacy. But I think the thing that, that gets, um, that people are concerned about is like, if I let my information out there, what happens to it next? Yeah. Like, you know, who else looks at it? And so I'm glad that the GDPR, you know, has been a model for other countries about sort of onward transfers and consent for, you know, for data use. To me, that's really key. So that's something that we don't have here in the U.S. to a great extent, except for laws like um, the CCPA, where they're saying if you give your data to a company for one reason, you know, they need to let you know if they're going to sell it to someone else or if they're mm -hmm. going to be able to use it for a different reason. So that is one of the really big things that sort of created these, you know, multi-billion and trillion dollar companies because mm -hmm. once they got certain data, they could do mm -hmm. almost whatever they wanted with it. What are your thoughts? No, absolutely. I I'm all for this transparency and this is one of the key reasons why I'm working on MUNA because I believe that when we bring more transparency, not only the way data is being processed by the companies, but to the value transactions that the company or you are making with it. So, you know, you give these examples from US, but we also have the same examples from EU. So. Uh, we have uh, Carrefour is the French uh, supermarket brand. They also have a bank. Um, and they, what they do is that they take their uh, data they gave from, get from the customer transactions and they sell that as analytics to, to companies. So essentially this is a new revenue stream for them. Now, just recently they were, uh, they got a, like a 3 million fine from the, the, the French Data Protection Authority for not respecting the, the GDPR, uh, GDPR. So, uh, which means that they haven't been fully transparent also towards their consumers on what happens to the data that's been collected from them. And what I would like, because I use Carrefour here in Belgium all the time, and, not, and I'm not comfortable with the fact that I, I'm helping this company to make more money, but then what's coming to me? Because the prices are still the same as if I would go to the other uh, um, other supermarket. So there's no, there's a lack of transparency also in what, how the value is being created with the data. And I think that when we are able to have this more direct link between the company and the consumer, then there's also more transparency, transparency on the value exchange. Uh, and what I mean by that is um, when I give, because the, the, one of the biggest, um, Oh, let me put it this way, like when we talk about personal data monetization, next to the question of the, the, the legal consequences, the second question is like, how much is my data worth? Right. And a lot of uh, objections come and say, okay, well, my data is worth nothing, or it will be just like two cents a month, or mm -hmm. just minimal amount that would not make sense for me to sell data. And a lot of other startups have been doing this kind of data monetization. What they do is that they collect data from individuals, then they, they uh, aggregate it, anonymize it, and then sell the analytics. And obviously, if you have, let's say, 100,000 uh, consumers that gave the data, and then you sell one product, and then you need to 
take, take the profit from the one product and divide it with 100,000, mm -hmm. then it's not going to be a lot per person. And this also uh, becomes, makes the, the value, uh, how, makes the, uh, makes you, that you don't get a lot of money for your data. What I would like to see is that what's the real benefit if I give my uh, name, email address and other personal details to, to uh, the supermarket that is able to then market me uh, things and I buy more from them, then there's actually that direct link and then transparency on, okay, what was the value I helped to create? So in this way, my, my data can be actually valued 10 euros. So the company is ready to pay me 10 euros if there's a direct link without this aggregation or anonymization or so forth. Um, I'm not sure if I, if I made it, if I was a bit going a bit different places with this answer. No, no that's really good. Um, I feel like a lot of people who are against data monetization, um, you know, it, it's inevitable. It, it, there's, this, is, this has to go this way um, because once you have transparency, people see what their data is worth. The next yeah. question is, why can't I benefit from it? Or, yeah. you know, for me, yeah. I don't necessarily want to monetize my data. I would <laughs> love to see what my, what my data is worth yeah. to other people. Cause obviously these companies are making billions of dollars on this data. And I feel like yeah. a lot of it is they say, well, we take your raw data and then we make something new with yeah. it. So our investment in creating these systems to make something new you're not yeah. going to benefit from that. So we're just going to say, you know, we'll give <laughs> exactly. you a dollar or something for X, you know, whatever it is. But I feel like now with so many, um, uh, I like to call it a trust war. So with yeah. things like Apple being able to give people transparency and it's really forcing people to consent or understand what is happening with their data, people mm -hmm. are being more, you know, um, careful uh you know we're kind of stopping and reading these things because i get those on my phone where i have an app and it says do you want to share all your photos or just certain <laughs> ones and i have to really think about that i'm like do i really want them to have all my photos so the fact that it's really having you stop and ask those questions is really important but the flip side of that or the next step in that is you know now i'm being more selective with who I share my data with. And these companies, some companies are gonna get shut out from data sharing because I may decide, I don't wanna really trust you. So yeah. the next thing is how do those companies get data if I don't wanna share it? So they're gonna to have to try to entice me in some way to, to come back to them and share my data. So it, you know, it has to be mon monetary something, right? you know, some type of discount, some type of money, some type of benefit. And I feel like, and this may be a good segue to, to, um, you know, the, the data services act, you know, I, whenever I see any articles about data monetization, I always send them over to you. Uh, cause I'm like, Oh my God, I know Sama, she's really like looking at this, this issue. And I want to make sure you understand that and, uh, you know, make sure those things are things that we can talk about. So, uh, this has been a little bit, shocking to people, uh, the, the Data Services Act, where um, uh, Europe is, is uh, creating their data strategy. And part of this data strategy is creating a way for companies in Europe to be able to get data that maybe they would not have otherwise been able to obtain about consumers for either research or even commercial purposes. Um, what are your thoughts about sort of that push. I feel like a lot of people felt like, okay, well, the GDPR is such a strong law. It's about personal rights. And then when they saw this kind of data service act come up and they're like, wait a minute, like you're putting my data into a database for other people to see, you know, how can we reconcile those, those two things? Yeah, I have really a mixed feelings about like, on one hand, I'm, I'm super excited to be in Europe at this moment where you have the EU data strategy that is, it is now recognizing that you have these data intermediaries like what Muna is 
that can help consumers to get the benefit from their data. But then on the other hand, the EU data strategy is really from uh, meant to serve the companies and governments to have more data because EU recognizes that when companies have more data, they can make more profit. And you know, that's what we want to have a booming economy. Um, you know, you cannot uh, have a lot of technical advan uh, um, advances, for example, with AI, if you don't have enough data to train the AI on. Uh, so a lot of uh, SMEs and, uh, and other companies, they don't have that kind of access to data that they, they would need to, to do a data-driven innovation yet. So EU wants to really create this kind of place where companies would have access to this data. And I'm all in for this, but then as you were kind of also going to that sort of question, Mr. Okay, Aguke, does this happen at the expense of the consumer then? Um, and this is also where I would like to, again, call for that transparency and how do these companies, where they get the data and, uh, and how is then that data being used? And I would say, okay, well, let's then go for these data intermediaries. Like EU is also now, just in November, it came up with this uh, the uh, Data Governance Act where it is putting this sort of, okay, we have, let's put some rules for these data intermediaries that they really stay neutral, that they don't trust, like become, uh, they don't start to misuse the data they get from the consumers. And, uh, and so forth. There's still very, very light rules, but at least it's acknowledgement. But so far, EU has been kind of shying away to even take a really standpoint on uh, personal data monetization. It's more just always been talking about, okay, companies monetize their data. Um, so why do I have these mixed feelings is that on one hand, EU is doing this work to acknowledge and put some rules for these uh, data intermediaries that can help consumers to, to give data to companies but get something in exchange. Mm -hmm. But then on the other side, they are really wanting to sort of give a lot more to companies. I don't know if you okay. see what I mean, but what I really am trying to say is sort of that if you just only focus on the companies, but then you don't ask how the companies deal, deal with the data, you get these examples like the Carrefour. They are creating new revenue streams from the customers, but then there is lack of transparency in the, uh, how the value is being created and then subsequently how the data was used um, or how the data protection rights of the consumers were respected. So mm -hmm. do you just want companies to, uh, like how much more money you want companies to make with this data that they can get from the consumers. You know, because if you talk about data monetization, the first thing you, so data monetization itself simply refers to the way a company can either externally or internally make more money. Mm -hmm. It's not about individuals. So if right. you always sort of, are, is EU, more for the companies or more for the consumer? That's always sort of my, my question. Like, okay, mm -hmm. you want to kind of just show that, yes, obviously we are human centric and we are, you know, human rights goes beyond everything else, but then they only want, but say, so that's one, one point. And then the second point, but yes, we actually want just companies to make more money with the data from the consumer. So I think that there's a bit of a uh, clash there that the EU, it's not really uh, clearly pointing out on what's the, other I don't know, the tension between like how the human rights approach and then companies making more money with data. Right. I think that, um, so around the time that the GDPR came out, um, the, the, the working group that uh, puts out their recommendations, they have put out a letter about innovation. Uh, yeah. So the letter was saying, you know, we do want strong rights for individuals, but then we also understand that businesses need data and we don't want to stifle innovation. So I feel like a lot of the things with the, the government act and the, you know, the data strategy mm -hmm. is about understanding that the GDPR has in some ways had a chilling effect yeah. um, where companies are afraid 
in some ways to use data in certain ways. So they're trying to navigate their way through that. But it is true that companies do need data. You know, yeah. I okay. had a podcast recently uh, with a general gentleman who's an urban strategist, and he was talking about the challenge of getting data sets about cities, you know, to do studies and things like that. And it's like, if you're not like a very well-funded company, you know, you probably, you know, let's say, let's say you use Google or something. So you made all these agreements with Google about how they're going to share your data. But let's say some fledgling little company came up to you and asked you, can we have your data? You probably say, no way. Like, I don't know who you are, you know? So uh, be, being able to have companies that don't necessarily have the market power to be able to have data and be able to use it in certain ways, I think is, is an issue. And that's, you know, when I look at the, 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 the acts in terms of being able to have companies have more data, uh, it seems like it's something that's happening around the world. So Europe is not the only country that's looking at doing something like this, where you have like some, some, a uh, system that people can come in and search and use data, not necessarily replicate it and take it into their environments and do other things with it, but being able to, to find a way to have people have access to data and also have a, um, you know, respect the, the rights of individuals, I think is kind of what they're trying to do. And it's, you know, I like the fact that Europe is trying to trying to do. You have to start somewhere, right? So, uh, being able to have other countries really see how this is going to work out, I think, will be interesting. Because I think, you know, again, monetization is in, inevitable in some way. I had told someone recently, like I would pay for them not to sell my data, like almost, you know. The flip side, it's like, no, I don't really want that sold or something. So. Uh, Maybe that's another way that maybe they, you know, companies can make money by saying, you know, we'll protect your data and not sell it, you know. So I don't know. <laughs> no, I, exactly, and I mean, that's what I would like would love to see that Muna and uh, and other companies alike can be the access point to companies for that data. And that this also comes when we've been talking to, to companies uh, about our idea. They're very interested because they see that, okay, wow, I mean, that's a transparent way to be connected to your customers. And they also, because we work through offers, they also, also see, okay, well, we kind of do marketing. And I mean, because the why, especially smaller uh, uh, enterprises, one data is for marketing. And if they can sort of, if they can already start doing that and get data from the consumers who are interested about them, then they are, they are creating this kind this, this loop where the data is really going to that purpose that they want it. They don't need to go into, okay, let me scrap the internet and let me uh, do some shadow profiles and let me sort of try this in this, all these different ways to understand what, what's the consumer segment that actually likes our profile. So what we want to offer is transparency in many levels. So first is how the data is being collected, where it is being used, uh, uh, to start from there so that companies can have uh, an easy way to access data and to, to also respect the rights of the consumers. Um, and when, so that's for, from, for more from the marketing uh, perspective, we also talk to uh, manufacturers of consumer goods who don't have direct link to, to consumers. So they also have an interest to have a channel like uh, our company to uh, the consumers. There, they wouldn't offer maybe necessarily discounts to their products, but uh, some cash rewards uh, mm -hmm. to be able to, to get a bit more, a better understanding of what kind of customers uh, would be interested in their uh, products and how to do the, the product development. And this is for them a way to, to get that sort of, more, more, it's like market research mm -hmm. kind of tool and get that data that is, is of better quality mm -hmm. and then is, uh, is transparent, transparently uh, purchased so they don't need to go to these big data brokers where they right. get 
with data sets of anonymized data and so forth. So yeah. I see really that data intermediaries can be that uh, a way for com companies to get access to data. Yeah, I feel like, you know, I feel like we don't have control right now of our data, right? Yeah. So these data brokers, they take fragments of information that they yeah. know about us and they try to make assumptions about us. And some of those things can be wrong. And the fact that we don't even know what they are is problematic. So an example I gave to someone, let's say you like peanut butter. And, you know, like, so say you entered a contest and had peanut butter or whatever, and maybe that's one of the only things they know about you, but it, because that's the only thing they know about you, it has an outsized value in terms of the way that they profile you. So they, maybe they say, Sana, that's her favorite, peanut butter is her favorite food because that's the only thing we know about her or whatever. So that's not correct, right? Um, so I think that the way that the world is probably going is that people will want to sort of cultivate their personas probably um, on the internet and also try to decide what they want to share and what they don't want to share. Uh, do you feel like, you know, some people feel like, oh my God, like I, this is overwhelming and we can't like achieve this uh, right now. But I don't think that's true. I think that we can come up with a way, you, you know, it, 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 I think it would also benefit companies as well where we're choosing what we share with them. And then the information that we share is more accurate maybe than their assumption. What are your thoughts? I mean, absolutely. I, I agree everything you, with everything you just said. Like, that's my my absolutely my my view on it that companies will benefit from having access to, to quality data. I mean, first of all, they don't need to spend so much uh, energy and money uh, cleaning uh, data sets or trying to understand from data sets uh, who are their customers, what do they want, want, and so forth, or putting energy into having these different ways of, like I said, um, following consumer behavior in. Uh, uh, online when they can just directly be having the access to consumers. And what is also important to remember that com companies want continuous relationship with their customers. They don't right. just want one or few and they want uh, to know what, when is the next time you're gonna buy something. Because usually when they get the information, for example, uh, they are tracking your New, how you read their newsletter, which uh, clicks your clicking, clicking and as such. So that is actually when they are analyzing the data, that's already passed information for them. Because right. maybe you went to buy that and so forth. So there's this uh, problem for, for companies at the moment. They don't really know what the uh, consumers want and when they want it. And when they know it, they know it too late. Right. Um, so there's a huge benefit for companies to have uh, a link with their customers where they could get more relevant data uh, and more real-time data. And that comes when the consumer can say. So they, companies, they don't mind if they get less data. Mm -hmm. uh, and we said that, okay, I want to choose what I uh, show the company and what I don't show the company. And then uh, based on my conversation with companies, they're completely fine with this and they want to encourage that because then they know that what you give to them is the real thing. Right. So that when they when you do come and tell them that you like peanut butter, then they're like, okay, well now I know I can show her the peanut butter ad. <laughs> I don't need to uh, try to be like, okay, let me just show this ad for you like for a, for a month and maybe at the end of it, you'll, uh, uh, you'll get it. Or you look at the ad for more, 10 seconds more. Right. But, uh, uh, <laughs> there's a um there's an alliance called the phyto alliance which is fast id online and what they're trying to do is try to move towards a situation where people get past or, or away from passwords or try to create ways where people can connect to services in with less friction so more accurate and less friction um and one of the stats that that organization likes to tout is that the average person has about 90 usernames or passwords to log into services. So basically you think about it, we're all sort of sharing fragments of ourselves with all these different 
companies and it's hard to it's like impossible for you to like manage your privacy settings you know you, you versus 90 different companies right that you're doing so i feel like it's inevitable that it has to be a situation where the person owns their data and then or has more control over their data and then instead of them having to go to the company the company has to come to them to ask for their access because you know yeah, this is just is is unsustainable to do it in the way that we've been doing it in the past. What are your thoughts? No, yeah, absolutely. And I wanted to so this ties into the, the previous kind of we made about uh, about the from a, now more, more from the consumer point of view that when I talk to then to a lot of uh, consumers or it's just I I constantly want to have this uh, to to talk to people about what do they think about their privacy. So I. I found people online that I'm asking, okay, so how do you feel? Uh, do you care about your privacy? And then they're probably like, oh, maybe not so much. I mean, I know I should care about it, but I don't really do anything. But then when I ask them, for, for example, so how do you feel when uh, you're browsing your feed and you see an ad, then you always have the stories like, oh, you know, just yesterday I was uh, saying to my friend that I want to buy this bag and then... <laughs> And seconds later, I go online and I see this bag and I'm 100% sure they're listening to me. Yeah. You always get these stories. Uh, so people do care. And uh, it is. so I'm, I'm happy that they care because I want people to care about their privacy and to, to be very, um, to become more active. Uh, I mean, I know it's difficult, like you said. I mean, there's like, we have so many different profiles and it's really difficult to manage it, but that's where we need this kind of tools. Right. Uh, different kind of intermediaries who help us to to control the access and and that's also what EU wants and us putting in the strategy that okay yeah we realize that uh, it is difficult for consumers at the moment to use their, their data protection rights because it's it's just sort of it doesn't really fit into the user interface when we are right uh, here on a daily basis but that's where we need different kind of uh, solutions. Uh, yeah, so that, um, did that answer your question? Yes, yes, like, definitely, like, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like one thing, you start thinking about one thing and then, you know, there's so many things I want to say, so I'm always kind of like trying to. <laughs> well, you're covering it. You're doing a really good job of covering this. Um, so if it was like the world according to Sana and everyone does everything that you say, what would be your wish for you know, data privacy either in the EU or around the world. What do you think do we we need now that we probably aren't thinking about or aren't doing? Well, to me, it's, it's really just having this conversation, a loud conversation about what is what is what is what are those value exchanges, and we can have those by supporting startups. Not necessarily. Well, I mean, startups like like mine, but also the hundred others that are there are doing the, the same kind of work, trying to provide means for individuals to use their data protection rights. Um, so I think that there's a lot, loads of good ideas, lots of people working with brilliant solutions and we need to support those and so that individuals can have uh, a variety to choose from. And then with that work, eventually we can start to find those, those way, ways because we, we have many different challenges here. We have uh, kind of the legal challenges, but even more so we have that UX UI challenge on how to incorporate privacy into our daily lives so that it is really uh, instantaneous and easy and fun to do uh, so that we don't need to compromise uh, with our privacy and the good offers and the, and, and, uh, and the sort of the convenience. Yeah. I think, you know, it's, it is about choice, right? Customer choice, you being able to decide what you do with your data. So I'm hoping to see that people have more control or agency over their data and how they share it um, and not feel like, oh, I'm forced to share, you know, where, uh, you know, the, the U.S., a lot of times companies, because we don't have, have the same types of laws, uh, you know, many of these companies, they, they, some of them go too far, obviously, uh, with how they handle or manage data, but being able to give someone some type of control to say, you know, look, you know, we, we want you as a customer, you know, we want to, 
you know, uh, just being transparent with people what you're using the data for, I think would be really helpful um, for them to be able to make a, a informed decision about how they share their data with you or if they even want to share their data with you. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah well, excellent. Good. Excellent. Well, we're ending, we're coming at the end of our show. And thank you so much for, for doing this. This is such a hot topic. So I know a lot of people are going to be really excited to hear, you know, our conversation, but I think, you know, you're at the forefront of this and you've been sort of thinking about this. And I think, especially with the iOS 14 update with people getting more transparency about their data. And then recently, you know, with the WhatsApp um, data privacy change, people just went crazy about that. So so that gives me hope that people really do care about their privacy and they want, they want more transparency and they want to be able to make, you know, informed decisions about how they share their data. Yeah. Yeah. Sure they do. Yeah, well, thanks so much, Debbie. I mean, it's, a, it's always such a pleasure to talk with you. I really enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to be talking more because I think the data monetization issue is going to really heat up in 2021. Um, <laughs> very much so. So I think we'll be talking more about yes. this this year. So yeah, excellent. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate thank it. You. Yeah, you too.